God, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and I thank you, God. I thank you for this opportunity. I pray, God, right now, Father God, that you would remove me to the side. I pray right now, God, that you would minister to the hearts and the minds of your men and your women here this morning, God. Just like you gave me this word, Father, I pray that it would fall on good, noble, open hearts this morning, Father God. Move in a mighty and a powerful way, Lord. Use me as a vessel, Father, to preach your word, God. I pray in the name of Jesus. And everyone says, Amen. Amen. Okay, there we go. How's everybody doing this morning? Come on, I need some participation. I need you to say amen, amen. When you when you feel excited, say amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Amen. So this is the first service, and I want to uh, kind of break the ice a little bit. So I heard this this joke, and I want to I want to tell you this joke this morning. Amen. So has have you guys heard of the new store that they opened in New York City? No? Okay, well, it's a store where you could go and you could purchase a husband. Hello. Okay. So, but there's a couple rules to this story. I mean, there's a couple rules to the store. Once you purchase a husband, you can't bring the husband back. Hello. Okay. And there's six different levels, six different floors to this store. And the rule is once you go to another level, you're not allowed to come back down. Okay. So this woman goes to New York and she goes to purchase a husband. And um, the first floor she goes to, she sees a sign that says, these men have jobs. Hey, Amen. That sounds pretty good, right? Man with the job. She, so she goes, okay, that sounds pretty good, but I want to go to the next, the next level, the next floor. So she goes to the next floor, and the next floor, there's a sign that says, these men have jobs and love children. She thought, like, hey, okay, that's pretty good, right? You know, having a job and loving children, that, that's pretty good. But she was curious. She wanted to go to the next floor. She was on the next floor. So she went to the next floor, and on that level, the sign said, these men have jobs, these men love kids, and they also do chores around the house. She started thinking, like, hey, that's pretty good, right? Men that have jobs, love kids, and do chores but her curiosity wanted her to go to the next the next floor the next level so she did that she went to the next floor the third floor and the sign said these men have jobs they love kids they do chores and they're drop dead gorgeous she was like hallelujah thank you jesus right but she was like, man, I got to know what's on, what's on the fifth floor. So she goes to the fifth floor, and there's a sign that says, these men have jobs, love kids, they do chores, they're drop-dead gorgeous, and are very romantic. Oh, she could hardly stand herself. She was like, oh, my God, okay. But her curiosity, again, was like, I got to go to the sixth floor. I got to find out what's next. So she goes to the sixth floor. And as there's a there's someone there, and it says you are customer three million four hundred and twenty one thousand eight hundred and seventy two. This floor only exists to prove that women are impossible to please. I heard that joke, and I thought it was pretty, you know. So I wanted to share it with you this morning, kind of break the ice a little bit. So the portion of scripture that I want to use this morning is found in Matt in Mark chapter 2 verse 13. We're going to do some reading, amen. Mark chapter 2 verse 13. Let me hear you say amen. 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 And it reads like this. Then he went out again by the sea, and all the multitude came to him, and he taught them. As he passed by, he saw Levi, which is Matthew, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to them, follow me. 
And he said to him, follow me. So he arose and he followed him. Now it happened as he was uh, dining in Levi's house that many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many and they followed him. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and he drinks with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard it, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The disciples of John and of the Pharisees were fasting and they came and said to him why do the disciples of John and of the Pharisees fast but your disciples do not fast and Jesus said to them can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them as long as they have the bridegroom with them they cannot fast but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast in those days no one sews a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and tear and the tear is made worse and no one puts new wine into old wineskins or else the new wine bursts the wineskins and the wine is spilled and the wineskins are ruined but new wine must be put into new wineskins the title of my message here this morning is out with the old and in with the new i don't know if you realize it i don't know if you've noticed but we're going to a new level we're going to a we're going to a new season you know the season changed from winter to summer i mean how about how many of us are feeling the heat right got the air conditioner turned up a full blast and it's still hot in the house we just recently moved into an apartment and 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 that it's a small apartment and it's it's hard to get the hot the, the heat out of there we have air conditioners we have fan and everything but we're go we're going into a new season hello somebody we're going into a new thing that God is doing so this this month we're talking about parables what is a parable according to the dictionary parables are a short allegory story designed to teach a truth, a principle, or a moral lesson. What is the main message of a parable? Many commentators agree that Jesus is, speaks about two, there are two purposes for a parable. One is to reveal the truth to believers, to, and the other is to conceal the truth from non-believers. Let me say that again. Jesus uses parables for two purposes. One, to reveal the truth to believers, and the other, to conceal the truth from non-believers. I want to talk to you this morning about change. How many of us know that change, you know, nobody likes change, right? Nobody likes going through changes. I've never heard anybody say, man, I can't wait for the next change to come. I can't wait till I go through something else that's going to force me or, or make me change, right? Change is something hard to deal with, but it's something that we have to learn to deal with. It's something that we have to learn to embrace. My daughter Angelina, she's in South Africa. She's coming home, and I'm very excited about it. I'm super excited. But S Sister Sylvia gave Angelina the best advice that, that, that I ever heard. And when she gave her that advice, Angelina shared it with me. She said, you have to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Oh, come on. You guys didn't get that. Maybe you'll get it later on. Maybe you'll get it later on. Amen. But you got to learn to be comfortable in the uncomfortable because not everything is going to be comfortable not every time not every season that you're in not everything that you go through is going to be comfortable you're going to have to face uncomfortable situations amen, amen. so i did some studies and um there's a study by dr howard hendricks and he says five ways people respond to change when change is introduced, there are five different types of responses. You guys want to know the responses this morning? Yeah. Let me hear you say amen. amen. The first one is an early innovator. 
Between two to six percent of people are early innovators. They are people that run with the idea, who take advantage of it, who like the idea, who take ownership of it. And they are willing to, to put their, their neck out on the line to make sure that, that it happens. Amen? Do we have any people like that this morning? Yes. God bless you. Yep. Just one of you. <laughs> you see, these people are what we call groundbreakers. These people are what we call pioneers. These people are what we call trailblazers. I don't know about you, but I want to be known as a trailblazer. I want to be known as a something, as a pioneer. I want to, I want to be on the front line. A uh, uh, pastor preached a message on Friday and said to do all this and not make it to heaven, to do all this for nothing. No, I want to do it and I want to make sure it counts. I want to, I, I want, I want to be accepted. I want to be uh, those doors to fly open when I, when I go and meet my Father in heaven. Number one is the early innovators. We need to embrace things. We need to embrace change. Number two is between 13 and 16% of these people are called adapters. Their first reaction is is not exciting or it's not a positive reaction to change. But once they have a clear understanding, they adapt and they're willing to make changes for the better. How many of us know that's what we have to do? Sometimes we have to adapt. Sometimes we gotta, we, we gotta change our mentality. We gotta change the way we think about things. We have to adapt. We, at work, right? You, when you go to work and they give you something new or they tell you to do something, you have to learn to adapt. Well, here in the church, we also have to learn how to adapt. Amen? Amen. Number three is the next group of people that make up 34% are called the majority followers. These people can be persu persuaded to go either way. These people will follow the majority of the crowd majority of the time. Hello. They, if, they, if, if the majority doesn't like the idea, well, then they're not going to like the idea either. But if the majority goes, goes with it and likes the idea and likes the direction and likes the, the things that are going on, then they're going to join the majority. We don't need men and women that join the majority, amen? We need pioneers. We need men and women to stand up and, and, and not give in. Number four is the reluctant, which also make 34% of people. These people have a lack or a desire to help or to be involved. They are unwilling, they are hesitant, and not willing to participate in anything. They are the ones that always complain about something, that always got something to say about something, but are never willing to put their hands to the plow to make things happen. Nobody here, hey man. Let me turn this way like Pastor does. Right? Don't be reluctant. The fifth and the final one is antagonists. And these make up 16%. And they are the ones that fight tooth and nail. They oppose every change. They oppose everything and don't want to do anything. They are the ones that always say, well, I liked it better the way it was before. They are unwilling to change, unwilling to get rid of the, the mindset and the mentality that they had before to try something new. Hello, we got to get rid of the old and we have to embrace the new. The fact of the matter is that change is hard, right? Change is hard. Nobody likes change. In Luke chapter 5, verse 39, and no one having drunk old wine immediately desires new, for, the, for he says the old was better. The old way was better. Why do we have to change things? Why do things have to change? Why well, I liked it the way that it was. Why don't we keep it the same way? Because God is doing something new. Because God wants to pour out something new. And in order to do that, you have to change. Now, I'm not directly saying you. I'm saying me, too. Amen? I've been through a lot of changes since I've been here. I've been through changes. I mean, some I caused on my, uh, I brought upon myself, but others is because God has a plan and God has a purpose and a desire for my life, just like he does with you. Amen? 
So I want to go over this portion of scripture and talk about the reaction to change. There's a, a couple of people, characters in this in this portion of scripture, and I want to talk about their reactions and how they changed. Amen. Verse 13, then he went out again by the sea and all the multitude came to him and he taught them. Here Jesus was back at the Sea of Galilee, right? Back at the Sea of Galilee where he went out on a boat and he was preaching to the people. You see, he knew his purpose. He knew his plan. He knew what he had to do and he had to preach the, the word of God to the lost. He had to preach the word of God to the hurting, right? Amen? Amen. It's a little background about, a little content about what was going on at that time. When he went out to the sea, he was talking about the Sea of Galilee, which is connected to the city of Capernaum. Capernaum was a major town through which travelers would pass from different regions. When Jesus called his disciple, he, when he called his disciples, Andrew, James, John, to follow him, that was, that's where he called them at. This is where Jesus also told his disciples to throw the net on, go back out and throw the net on the other side. And that's where they caught the multitude of fish was at the Sea of Galilee. That's in John chapter 21, verse 6. Jesus also fed the multitude there in Capernaum. This is where Jesus tells his disciples to get in a boat, travel to the other side. And when they're traveling, a storm comes and they start and they start getting anxious and they say, oh, you know, they start getting all scared. And this is where Jesus comes and he walks on water and he go and he, and he calms the storm. Now, here he is back at the Sea of Galilee and, and he's preaching to the people. He's preaching to the lost. He's preaching to the hurting. And there's somebody here that responds to that. Look at verse. Um, hold on. Look at verse. 14, as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, follow me. And he arose and he followed him. You see, Matthew was a tax collector. Now, in order to understand, it wasn't really like a, a tax collector like we see the tax collectors now. But it was a at that at that time and in that in that culture, to be a tax collector was despised on. It was considered one of the worst things you could do as an occupation. You know, when, when Jesus called the other disciples, they were professional fishermen, right? Like somebody that had a job. Somebody that was looked at as a, a, a productive member of society. But a tax collector... Tax collectors were frowned on. Tax collectors were like, man, they, they didn't want to have nothing to do with tax collectors. Right. Now, you got to also remember, he was also a Jew. So that was like double. That was like double a, a, a negative on top of another negative. So to be a Jew, I did some research and I did some study. To be a Jew meant that you had to lose your identity as a Jew to be a tax collector to work for the Roman government. You had to lose your identity. You had to lose yourself in your job. You had to lose your place at the synagogue with, with all the other Jewish leaders, the, the Sadducees, the, the Pharisees would go every single day and, and, and socialize and talk about the things that are going on. This is, he had to give all that up to be a tax collector. See, the way that it worked was people would bid to be a tax collector. So a person would give the government of Rome a bid, a large number, a quota that they would have to meet to fulfill or collect in property or in taxes. And the government, the Roman government, would decide whether or not they wanted him to be a tax collector on a bid. Like, if they gave him a number and the government liked that number, then they would say, okay, you're going to be a tax collector. And that's what Matthew was. Matthew was a tax collector. 
but it was a process. Once you fulfilled your quota, after you met the number that you had agreed to, everything else that you got on top of that was extra. Everything that you got, you can keep. So it was one of the corrupt, it was one of the most wickedest uh, uh, occupations at that time because once they met that quota for, for the government, then they were able to keep things. So here he is in the city of Capernaum where there was a lot of fishing, a lot of fishermen, a lot of uh, public areas, a strategic area. That's where he would go and that's where he would set up a booth, right? To get the most people to, to, uh, uh, to, to pay taxes. Are you still with me? Yeah. I'm going somewhere this morning, amen? He said to him, follow me, and he arose and he followed him. You see, I believe that Matthew was desperate. I believe that Matthew was in a place where he was sick and tired of being sick and tired. I believe that when Jesus came along and he saw Matthew sitting at the tax booth, it was because he was so tired of being despised by everybody. He was so tired of, of living the life that he lived. And here Jesus was giving him a new opportunity, something new this morning. Can I get an amen? Can I get a hallelujah? Thank you, Jesus. I remember a time in my life when I was broken. I remember a time in my life when I had hit rock bottom, when there was no, nobody wanted nothing to do with me anymore. My mom didn't want to have nothing to do with me. My, my, my family shunned me out. They said, no, you, you're doing all bad. My wife didn't want to have nothing to do with me. But how many know that Jesus came and that's when Jesus met me? Just like he did with Matthew. Just like when he came in this portion of scripture. He came and he saw him and he said, follow me. He dropped everything and to follow him. His response to change was a good response to change. But you know what? You have to be desperate. You have to be willing. You have to have, you got to be ready for change. The thing is, is sometimes we're not ready for change. We like living in our misery. We like living the same thing, the same way that we did before. We like the way it was, and we are unwilling or unable to change. Man, thank you, Lord. High five myself. It's not by accident that Mark, the writer of this gospel, in chapter 1, he talks about healing a leper. Now, the man with leprosy, he caught leprosy, right? He caught leprosy, and it was an outward condition. It was an outward condition on the outside. He, can't, he couldn't do nothing about it, but he caught leprosy, and he was shunned out because he had leprosy, and he didn't want anybody else catching leprosy. But Jesus went, and he healed the leper, right? Mark talks about that in chapter 1. Now here, uh, Mark is talking about Matthew, and Matthew's condition isn't an outward condition. It's an inward condition. Hello, somebody. It's a condition of the heart. It's a condition of what's going on on the inside. You might look like you got it all together, amen? You might look good in your suit, your shoes. Everything looks good, but what's going on in your heart? What's going on that you ain't telling nobody about? What's going on that you're afraid to say anything about? Come on. Hey, man, you guys are quiet this morning, man. Come on. Amen. God is good. Jesus went and he touched and he healed the leper. Now he's here and he's telling this tax collector who was shunned out by the community, was shunned out by the Jewish community, didn't want to have nothing to do with nobody. He tells him, follow me. Get up. Follow me. Come on, get up and follow me. I'm trying to do something new inside of your life. I, want, I know the plan and the purpose that I have for you. Amen. You got to think about what Jesus did right here. He didn't just ask this corrupt, dishonest traitor that nobody wanted anything to do with. I believe that Jesus saw him at the tax booth collecting taxes, went up to him and witnessed to him and said, I got something better for you. Thank God. Thank God that he sees the final outcome. Thank God that he knows what's best for us. When we decide to go our own separate way or we decide to do things in our own strength and our own ability, that's when God says, no, I have a plan and I have a purpose for your life. Not only for you, but for your family also. Amen. 
Look at your neighbor and say, Jesus is offering something new. I believe that Matthew was desperate for change. Are you desperate this morning? No. I can remember a time in my life where that's all I had was desperation. That's all I had. All I had was just to be desperate. Desperate for the things of the world and now desperate for the things of God. One of the first things, okay, let's go to 15, verse 15. And it says, now that it happened, he was dining in Levi's house, and many tax collectors and sinners also sat together with Jesus and his disciples. For there were many, and they followed him. See, the first thing, the first thing that we see happens with Matthew is change. Oh, come on. The first, you didn't hear me. The first thing that happened with Matthew is evidence of change. He went from collecting taxes to inviting Jesus to his house and feasting with sinners and tax collectors. He went and he did the total opposite. You know how you know somebody has changed? You know how you know somebody has given their life to the Lord? It's when you see true evidence of change. When you see transformation, when you see people no longer acting the same way, people no longer speaking to their wives the same way, no longer speaking to their, their children the same way, no longer acting the same way that they used to act, but something totally different, something brand new. There was true transformation. He had found acceptance in Jesus. He had found love, and now he felt that, and he wanted everybody else around him to feel the same way. Now, you see, what's important about this is that now Jesus, who was a, who was a man of God, right, he went and he was eating with the sinners and the tax collectors, right? The most despised people, the people that were, nobody wanted anything to do with, the people that everybody despised and didn't want to hang around with or didn't want to be around. Here Jesus is hanging out with them, eating with them. Uh, uh, and at that time they were feasting. You were laying on the ground and you were right next to, right next to them, laying right next to him, talking right next to him, spending time with them, right? Now, the, when the Pharisees called somebody a sinner, what they were talking about were the Jews who were not committed to the things of God, who were not deeply committed to the traditions of men, who were not committed to the things of God. They, were kind, of, they kind of just lived their lives the way they wanted to live, not obeying the law, not coming to church. Hello. You see, tax collectors and sinners are often, were often grouped together and, and they signify those people who placed themselves out of the society and the community of God. For Jesus to have fellowship with such people would bring him into the conflict of the Pharisees, the traditions, the beliefs of the Jewish law, the beliefs of the traditions of the men at that time. Pharisees were called Pharisees because they were the separated ones, the most committed to keeping the law of God. And they had the understanding that salvation came from being separate, from being set apart. So they would distance it. They would distance themselves from people who were sinners and who were tax collectors, people that didn't want to come to church, people that didn't want to follow the things of God. They thought because they were separated from them that they were more holy that they were doing a righteous thing. Oh, but how many of us know that there's nothing righteous inside of us? There's nothing good that's inside of me and you. There's nothing good except for God. God is the only thing that's good. Amen. says that our righteousness is nothing but filthy rags. Amen. Yeah, we all know what filthy rags are, right? Man, some disgusting, old, dirty, crusty... <laughs> Dirty rags. That's what our righteousness is. And here the Pharisees are acting more like righteous. They're acting righteously. 
But here, the Messiah, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, God in the flesh, is having a feast with tax collectors and sinners. How many thank God for that? I thank the Lord for that. It was unheard of or unthinkable or even scandalous for Jesus to speak to a tax collector or a sinner. Not only speak to them, but invite him to follow him. And that's what he did. He invited him to follow. Verse 17, and when Jesus heard it, he said to, okay, so in verse 16, it says, and when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, they said to his disciples, how is it that he eats and he he drinks and he eats with tax collectors and sinners. And 17, then Jesus heard it and he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Amen. He didn't come to call those that didn't need help. He didn't come, he didn't come to for those that thought that, hey, I got this on my own. I, I, I'm okay. No, he came for those that were desperate, those that were in need, those that, that knew I, hey, I'm messed up, I'm tore up, I'm jacked up, I'm beat up from the feet up, messed up from the neck up, I'm tore up. I need a Savior. Man, that's why I thank God for the, the ministries of Victory Outreach, amen? I thank God for the men's home because when my life was out of control, when my marriage was out of control, I had no direction and no purpose, there was a place for me to go. And it's not always a bad thing to go there, man. That was God's design and God's purpose and God's plan for my life. I thank God because that's where God began to shape me and mold me to be the man, to be the husband, and to be the father that I am today. Amen? Amen. I thank God for, for the ministries of Victory Outreach. I thank God for the homes. Amen. Verse... 17, when Jesus heard, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician. That's like a doctor who doesn't want to see sick patients. What is the point of being a doctor if you're not going to hear, if you're not going to see the sick people? Well, there is no point. There's no point of that. So if you don't, I mean, not that you, He's talking about a spiritual condition. He's talking about a condition that's inside. You might not be sick on the outside, but you're, you know, I remember a time when I was sick on the inside. When I, I, I was so messed up, I didn't know if I was coming. I didn't know if I was going. I didn't know what I wanted to do. But then Jesus came, and that's where Jesus began to heal. How many of us know we need a healing? Amen. Not a healing on the outside, but a healing on the inside. A healing in my heart. A healing in my soul. Come on, somebody. Another point is that Jesus was prioritizing people. He wasn't prioritizing the, the traditions of man. He wasn't prioritizing, you know, like later on we'll see, fasting. He wasn't prioritizing those things. What he was prioritizing was he was prioritizing the people. He knew what his priorities were. That's what we have to do as men of God and women of God. We have to know what our priority is. Our priority has to be God. Our priority has to be serving God. Our priority, because I remember at a time where I had no priorities. Well, I mean, I had one I, just to get high, right? Oh, okay, I was the only one. I'm sorry. <laughs> to get high, to get drunk, to, to do what I wanted to do. But now my priorities have changed. Hello. It, you see, what's important is the people. What's important to Jesus is the people. And we see that here because he wasn't sticking to the traditions of man. He was, he was where the need was at. He was there where the need was, and the need were with the sick. The need were there with the sinners and the tax collectors that nobody wanted a part of. Verse 18, 18 through 20, it says, The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting. And when they came and said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast? But your disciples do not fast. And Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them as long as they have, the, as long as they have them. Okay, hold on. I can't, it, 
verse 18 and 19. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting, and they came, and he said to him, Why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, Can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them, and they will fast in those days. So the Jewish law required that there would be a fast on the Day of Atonement. One day out of the year, there would be a fast on the Day of Atonement in the Jewish culture, in the Jewish tradition. But here we see that the, Jew, the Jewish leaders, the, the, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they fasted twice a week. They fasted on a Monday and they fasted on a Thursday. So what they were doing is they were changing the law. They were changing the traditions. They were adding to it. How many of us know we can't add to what God is doing? We have to learn to change. We got to learn to submit and obey and allow God to do changes inside of our lives without adding anything to it or subtracting, right? So here they are, they, and they thought that if you were a man of God, if you were in the church, that you had to fast for these two days. You had to fast on a Monday and you had to fast on a Thursday between 6 in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. So they were adding to the traditions. Now, Customs developed like fasting. They would fast for mourning or they would fast if somebody was in sin. They would fast for repentance. If some, if some on was sin and fasting and repentance. Now the Pharisees made fasting a duty twice a week from sunup to sundown, Monday and Thursday. And they wore, and they, they wore it like a badge of honor. They wore it like they were better than everybody else. Right? A badge of honor in their in their religious beliefs. If you were serious, serious, serious man of God, you would fast twice a week. Devoted to the law, you would fast. Now, Jesus didn't come to put a bandage on the old traditions. The old traditions that they had, Jesus came to complete the tradition, amen? Jesus came to accomplish it. But Jesus was doing something new. He was doing something new at that time, and he was teaching his disciples not to fast with the saints, but to feast with the sinners. He was teaching them something different, something new. He was showing them how what was important to prioritize people. Right? Here's just a side note. It says, has anybody ever, has anybody ever fasted before? Yeah. yeah? Yeah? What happens when you see, when you, when you're doing a fast and you see somebody else eating? <laughs> All right? You're all, man, brother. You don't know how to fast or what? You get all, you know, I get all upset. I remember uh, Brother Sammy. Brother Sammy would always say, if you're not happy when you're fasting, go eat a Happy Meal because you're doing it for nothing. <laughs> right? <laughs> you see, the Pharisees added to this, this tradition and they made fasting like a badge of honor. Like it made them more holier than everybody else. So here Matthew came and he had a feast and it was probably on one of those days that they were fasting because the, the tax collectors and the, I mean, because the, the Pharisees came and asked, why do you and your disciples, why are you not fasting like we're fasting? Why are, why aren't you following the traditions of man? Why aren't you following the rules? Why aren't you following the way that we've established things to happen? Why aren't you following the traditions of man? Because Jesus wasn't there to do the old. Jesus was there to do the new. Come on. Hello. Yeah. Give me uh, two points. We have to be sensitive of the time that Jesus, of the season and the times that are going on right now. Here he said, that he's the bridegroom. Here he's saying that you don't, he's reminding them about their culture and the tradition. When you have a wedding in a Jewish culture, they would party for seven days. 
they would party for seven days, man. Right? They would they would they would celebrate. They would celebrate the the bridegroom. They would celebrate the things that, that the the wedding that was taking place. We have to learn to be sensitive. These Pharisees were not sensitive to the things going on right in front of their face. The king was right in front of them, and they didn't even know about it. They were too worried about doing the traditions of man. They were too, too worried about the way people see them or the way people look at them. They were too worried about other things. We have to learn to prioritize the things that are important. We got to be sensitive to what God is doing. God is doing a new thing here at Victory Outreach Reno. Amen. God is doing a new thing. This is a new season that we're in. We have to be sensitive. Sensitive to the season and the times that we're in. You see, Jesus was talking about the bridegroom. And I really got I really got into the bridegroom. But I mean that's for another message, but there was a, a way of in the Jewish culture there was a a, a, a uh, a way of getting married, right? The so what you would have to do is the fathers would go to the other father and they would talk about their son and their daughter getting married. They would make arrangements. And then after the arrangements, they would make a betrothal. betrothal. And they would make an agreement, like sign a contract on both sides. Of, uh, as you see, at that time, it wasn't just two people coming together. It was two families that were coming together. They were joining together, and they would become one. You see, that is exactly what Jesus is trying to do inside of our lives here this morning. He uses the analogy of a bridegroom. He says, I'm the bridegroom. You don't fast when, uh, when you're at a wedding. You don't fast when you have the bridegroom that's right here. No, you celebrate. You celebrate. You are, you, you, you're joyful. You sing, you dance, you celebrate. Here the, the, the Pharisees were trying to follow their, they were trying to do things in their own eyes. They were trying to do things in their own way. But it wasn't working. Here Jesus said, I'm doing something new. There's a lot more into that though, because it's a it, it's a reflection, it's a mirror of Jesus Christ and how he's coming back for his church. He's coming back for a bride that's ready. He's coming back for a bride that's pure. Amen. And who's the bride? The bride is us, the bride is the church. You see, the characteristics of the old traditions were mourning, sorrow, crying, ripping of the clothes, fasting. Those were things that were in the old covenant. Now the new covenant is here, and now Jesus is doing a new thing. Thank God for the new thing. It's a relationship that we are in with Jesus Christ. It's not about your works. It's not about following the old patterns or the old ways, but it's about Jesus having a personal relationship with you and I. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw him eating with the tax collectors and sinners, how is it that he eats and he drinks with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus said, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The disciples of John and the Pharisees were fasting when they came and said to him, why do the disciples of John and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not? Then Jesus said to them, can the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. But the day will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast. You see, he was talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. You see, we got to be sensitive in the time that we're in right now. We're in a go, 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 get, get in the car, let's go. We're in a season right now where it's not a time for you just to be sitting there. It's not a time for you just to be uh, uh, sitting on the pew, but it's a time that we need everybody's hands on deck. We need everybody to play their part, to do their part, to be involved. You got to be sensitive to the season that we're in. We're in a season right now where everything is moving. And if you don't join, if you don't, if you don't jump in right now, you're going to get left behind. And I don't want, I don't want to be left behind. Amen. Amen. In verse 20, 
He says, but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and they will fast in those days. No one sews a piece of unshrunken cloth on an old garment or else the new piece pulls away from the old and the tear is made worse. Right? So he's saying these old traditions, these old ways, they were good for the time that they were there, but now there's something different that has to take place. Now there's something new that's going on. There's something different. There's a change in the atmosphere. There's a change in, in, in the season. There's a change in what's going on. We have to learn to be sensitive to those things, those changes. You can't, Jesus didn't come to put a patch on the old system, the old Ju Judaism system. No, he came to make things new, a new relationship, a new mindset, a new understanding, a new way of thinking, a new way of doing things, a new thing that Jesus is doing. You can't patch, it says you can't take a new piece of garment and put it on an old, an, uh, an old pair of pants. You can't do that because the first thing that happens when you go and wash it is that new patch is going to shrink and it's going to tear everything. It's going to tear apart the old, the old pair of pants. You can't put something new on an old thing. You can't mix the two. You can't place, you can't put them together because they're not going to work anymore. You got to, you, you have to be able to change. You got to be able to adapt. You got to be able to, to develop the new thing that God is doing inside of your life. Amen. You see, Jesus came to, to bring joy. Jesus came to bring a new relationship. Okay, let's talk about relationships, right? Well, I'm going to talk about mine and Ilana's because God put our relationship back together. Now, for the longest time, because it took me a long time to figure it out, man, almost like 15 years, that I can't do things the old way, the old Tino, the old attitude, the old messed up way that I was before. Because what's the definition of insanity? Is doing the same thing and expecting different results. Now, I'm in a relationship with my wife again, and it's better than it's ever been. It's better than it's ever been because God put it back together the way that it should be put back together. Amen. And when God does something, it's better than you or I or anybody, no, no marriage counseling or no anybody can do. When God puts it together, God puts it together the right way. Amen. Now, if I would have took my old insecurities, if I would have took my old thoughts, my old ways, and tried to add them to the new thing that God did, it would destroy everything. It would tear apart everything. Do you guys kind of understand the analogy that I'm using here this morning? It's a relationship with Jesus that he's trying to get a new relationship. You can't take the old things and place them in the new. You got to you gotta come with a new mindset. I, I, this is a new relationship. This is a new commitment. This is a new thing that God is doing inside of my life. It's inside of my marriage, inside of my household, inside of my job. Amen. I'm almost done. <laughs> three, okay, so now three ways to get rid of the old wineskin. We don't want to be the same way that we were before. We want to change. But it takes time. It takes patience. It takes effort. Right? You're, the thing with change is, let's put it this way. When you start losing weight, you know, going to the gym, exercising, eating right, you don't see a change right off the bat. Amen. But until somebody comes up to you and somebody tells you, hey, you look different. Hey, you know what? You look like you lost some weight. You don't, really, you don't even realize it until somebody comes up to you and tells you. Hey, you know what? You look a little thinner. Oh, I don't feel like it, you know. I've been doing this long. I've been working out and, and eating right and doing things for a long time, and I haven't seen any results. 
That's the thing about change is you're not always going to see results right away. You're not always going to feel like things are changing. But as long as you continue to serve God, as long as you continue to be faithful, as long as you keep putting one foot in front of another, as long as you keep and don't give up. Jesus is doing a new thing inside of your life here this morning. You're not the same person that you were when you first got here. And even though you don't see the change, even though you don't feel the change, you're changing. God is working it out for you. God is placing you and God is moving things, shaping you and molding you into the man, into the woman of God that he's required you to become. Amen. If the worship team can make their way. Three things. How to get rid of the old wine. And how to embrace the new. Number one is devotion. Jesus represents devotion as a matter of the heart. Jesus wants something different from the usual. Jesus desires sincere, heartfelt devotion. Devotion as a matter of developing an intimate relationship with the living God. How do you do that? You be honest. You be sincere. Like, God, I'm not feeling it today. God, God, I don't know if I'm going to make it today. And God will give you strength through that season that you're going through. God will give you wisdom and knowledge in what to say and what not to say. But you have to be sincere. You have to you have to be devoted. You got to find time to spend in the relationship, the new relationship that Jesus is trying to build in your life this morning. You have to trust and you have to have complete love. You have to know that only total love and true worship from God can help you love yourself and help you love others. Number two is discipleship. You need, we, somebody tell your neighbor, you need discipleship. You see, righteousness no longer consists of observing, of just watching, just sitting on the pew or, or just watching people. You have to be involved. You have to get involved. You have to get involved in a life group. You have to get involved in discipleship. You have to let people, I don't know about you, but this is a people-driven ministry. There's going to be people. You're going to deal with people. You got to let some people in, and you got to let other people out. But you have to deal with people. This no longer consists of observing, of just watching or practicing, but the requirements of the law or the rituals or custom or traditions. Jesus himself alone has fulfilled the law. That's what I want to get at, is Jesus came to fulfill, to make it complete. Therefore, he has become our righteousness. It's not my righteousness anymore. It's not your righteousness, but it's the righteousness that we serve God. We serve Jesus Christ. Amen. He's the one that paid the price on the cross. There's nothing that I can add. There's nothing that I can subtract. There's nothing that I can do to take that what away Jesus has done on the cross. That relieves so much pressure. Right? Because now you're not trying to be good. You're not trying. You know you're going to mess up. You know you, there's going to be times where you blow it. But Jesus already died on the cross for every single time. Number three is refining. You see, expect and welcome the refining process that Jesus is doing inside of your life. The refining work of the Holy Spirit. Discipline yourself to turn away from anxiety and from sin. Discipline your mind to, even though you don't feel like getting up in the morning or you don't feel like it, man, you do it because you love Jesus. You do it because you, you like, there's sometimes, I'm just going to use my wife because, I mean, I'm married, amen? 
sometimes where I feel like I don't love my wife. And at those times, those are the times that it counts the most. Those are the times that she remembers is when I didn't want to do it. It's when I didn't want to get up and, and, you know, we're both resting and laying in bed. And she goes, can you give me some water? I'm going, oh, my God. I got to get up. I got to go all the way to the kitchen. I got to find a cup. Got to fill it with water. Take it back. But I do it because I love her. I do it because God restored my marriage. God brought my family back together. God saved me. He saved me from my destruction. He saved me from the that that messed up thinking. Man, you, you see me now, but man, I was messed up. I'm still messed up, but I'm not as messed up as I was when I got here. And I thank God for that. Let's all stand. This morning, I just want to I want to open up these altars, and I, I want you to embrace change this morning. I want you to ask God, where and what part of my life do I need to embrace change? And what part of my life are you pointing your finger at? Are you pressing your finger on? What part are you trying to change inside of my life this morning? I don't want that old way, that old mindset, or that old mentality, the old way of thinking, God, but I desire something new. I want something new. I don't want the old anymore. I want to be changed. I want to be transformed. I want you to do something inside of my life, God. Have your way here this morning, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. I came here. I came here with nothing but all